Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Drawing School's Creative Conversation Series. For the last in our Creative Conversation Series this term, I'm really delighted to introduce Charles Henry Smith and Deborah Swallow this evening, who will be discussing the Art Museum in Modern Times. We're, we're in expert hands uh, because Charles Henry Smith has just published a book on this subject, well indeed with this title. Um, his book was published by Tenzin Hudson in, in just a few months ago in March 2021 and it offers 43 case studies on the way that museums present and display works of art, beginning with the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So Charles Henry Smith is chairman of the Royal Drawing School. Uh, he was previously secretary and chief executive of the Royal Academy and prior to that director of the National Gallery and the National Portrait Gallery. He's also an honorary professor at Queen Mary University and professor of architectural history at the Royal Academy. Charles will be in conversation this evening with Professor Deborah Swallow, who is Marit Rousing director of the Courtauld and its first female director. Deborah is a specialist in the arts and culture of South Asia, and she champions research, education, and wide public access to global arts and their histories. And as the Quartel Gallery has been undergoing an extensive and transformative renovations uh, project, uh, which we can expect to be revealed in, in November, this is a really fascinating moment to hear Deborah's thoughts on how we display and experience art today and what museums and galleries might look like in the future. So uh, welcome, welcome to you both, um, and thank you. Thank you for joining us. And just to remind all of you listening that, of course, you're, you're most welcome to ask questions um, and leave them in the chat or Q&A box and, and they'll be addressed at the end. OK, so I am going to start just by explaining the format of what we're going to do. Rather than go through all 43 case studies, we're actually not going to go through any of the ones in the book. But what we're going to start doing, and actually it may take the whole of the time, is talk about what Debbie is doing at the Courtauld, which not surprisingly, I'm very interested in not having seen it, but knowing some of the plans and use it as a case study, which isn't in the book to explore some of the ideas in the book. And before we start, I just thought I would um, say a little bit about the book by way of background, if we could have the first slide. So uh, there's not a huge amount to add, to what Claudia has said. I was at the Royal Academy and at the time I was leaving the Academy, I had a conversation with the, um, she was publishing director at Thames and Hudson and now she's managing director. I had done a book with them on East London, which was based on a blog I do. And I, I thought I could do another book like that because it was relatively straightforward. And she said, that she wanted to read what she called a real book. And I knew what she meant, which was a proper series. Uh, but it, she didn't tell me that she also wanted footnotes. And so I wrote the whole thing and then she reminded me that she needed footnotes so that I had a nightmare time um, before delivering it last March in which I had to reconstruct the footnotes. Um, essentially, it's these case studies. I. I approached it without a very clear view of what I would discover. I, I wanted to basically put in context the building projects I've been involved with, mainly the, uh, the Portrait Gallery, the Ondaatje Wing, and then later the Royal Academy, the development in Burlington Gardens into a broader context. And I started off doing a history of museums in the post-war period, and it got too big and too general. And I cut it down to these case studies. And then at the end, I did a series of sort of attempts to analyze what had changed. And we'll talk about those, um, I hope, as we talk about what's ha happening at the Court Hill. But at this juncture, I'm going to half hand over to Deborah. Debbie. Uh, uh, um, but uh, as she said, I'm allowed to interrupt and I, I have every intention of doing so, so that it is a conversation. I should maybe say, uh, in case you think that we know one another, we do, because we were both high, hired by Roy Strong at the v and so long ago that they wouldn't like to say how long ago it was. And we worked together at the v &A, and I've kept him pretty close touch with her ever since. And she actually came to stay with us. We stayed in a project done by their architects, Witherford Watson Man, which you can rent. 
and I thought it would be good for her to see it as the castle, so she came and stayed. Okay, Debbie, over to you. Thanks so much, Charles, and um, and huge thanks to the Royal Drawing School for inviting me to have this conversation with you. Um, it's it's a really great pleasure, and yeah, yeah. I mean, we go back a long way. Um, I, we actually, I think, had had the title "The Young Turks of the," along with some other wonderful close friends, "Young Turks of the V&A," but um, as the audience remembers, that was many years ago. But it was a fun time. We we had great fun uh, and did, uh, the V&A. Um, I just want to set the scene really, I mean, it, it seems odd to be talking about the Courtauld um, sitting in an 18th century building in the centre of London as part of a modern museum movement, but I think in a strange way we, we are, and I think it is relevant um, to uh, what, what we are trying to do. But I just wanted to quickly to locate you, so those of you who don't know, the, 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 the Somerset House is on the Thames, um, it was literally, uh, originally, literally on the Thames with a water gate created by, um, under the patronage of George III, uh, designed by William Chambers to house the, a series of tax offices and the Navy, and also the, um, the rooms of the great um, Enlightenment societies, the Royal Society, the Science Society, the Royal Academy of Arts, and the Antiquaries. Um, Today, uh, where we sit in the, in the North Block, which is where those societies were housed, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, which looks wonderfully um, palatial, I and mean, it, it almost could be in Paris, um, uh, with, the, with the rather nice um, fountains that now, that now exist. But actually, um, and, and actually that's, so, and go to the next slide, and it was where... The, the kids don't often play now. They, they were done by Jeremy Dixon and Edward Jones, who did the development at yeah, the... No, they're lovely. They do. No, they, they do. At the moment, they're, they're not doing so because they're, they're uh, above them is sitting an ecological forest. Okay. Uh, divided by S. Devlin as part of the design biennial. So, so, so they play in between other events going on in the courtyard. They do, they do still play, and they are lovely. Uh, but I mean, this this slide, Charles will be very familiar with. I'm sure many of the audience will be too. This was the, of course, we uh, have in our building the great room of the original or near original Royal Academy of Arts, where paintings were hung from floor to almost from floor to ceiling, where the great um, the great uh, competition to be situated on the line in the most prestigious place was fought out between artists and where um, society, the first sort of public society, came and attended the great summer exhibition, which of course has been going on since, since then and which Charles oversaw, of course, for many years at, at the Royal Academy himself. Uh, the, um, the Great Room was the largest public space for art exhibitions at the time it was created. So a very significant historical space. So that is at the top of our, the building we now inhabit. And um, next slide, please. And even at the time when this was going on, the, there was plentiful satire about the, um, the public that would attend these exhibitions with a lot of uh, sort of joking about whether they were look, going to watch the art or to see the people indeed see those tumbling down the stairs and see things they shouldn't see. Um, this, 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 of course, dates this by Rob Thomas Robinson, so dates to the early days of the Academy at the court, uh, what is now the, the Courtel building in the North Block. But what's no, more it's, interesting... Uh, sorry, it's, it's worth saying, it's such a flimsy staircase. I mean, it was designed in a way which was very flimsy, considering that Chambers was himself treasurer of the Royal Academy. It's slightly weird that he didn't make for... I mean, there, there's a big staircase on the other side, but the public room well, they're, they're, very they're, insubstantial. They're sim actually, they're similar to the, the ones on each side. They're both similar, but they're, but they're very, I mean, uh, we, we, of course, in our press, in our, in our press coverage, we call them elegant rather than flimsy, okay. but, they, right. but, they, but they, are, they, are, uh, they are cantilevered staircase, which of course is, is rather wonderful technology, and I'll come back to that a bit later. But yes, they are in some ways very very flimsy and certainly very elegant. Um, and some of the other staircases in Somerset House are much more substantial, there is no question. Um, what's interesting about this building, which looks palatial on the outside, is in fact that it is a mess inside, if I can put it that way. If we have the next slide, the, this is the division of usage of the building. 
Now, if you can see the numbers, uh, number four, which is the biggest single bit, is the Royal Academy. They were the dominant society, Royal Academy of Arts. The, um, the Royal Society and the Antiquaries access their side of the building, their, their rooms through another, the opposite staircase. And they fought over that staircase. They hated sharing the staircase. And as some people have sort of noted, if we'd been in Paris, not in London, each of these societies would have had a grand building and courtyard itself. Uh, Little England, of course, is quite mean on its public spending, even in George III's time. And so they're all scrunched together. And they built walls against each other. And I'll come back to that because this, what this means is that this building that we inhabit, which looks so palatial and, and uh, coherent on the outside, is a sequence of vertical terraces, some of which are funnily disposed as well, which means that there is no lateral communication at all. And that means that once we occupied it in the 1980s, late 1980s, we, we still had problems because we, we moved in sort of as if it was a set of terrace houses again. And we didn't really resolve those architectural problems. And that's true all the way around the courtyard, isn't it? That it was in designed. Part, yes, yeah. it's, it's in part true. I mean, the others are, the, the others are less messy than, than right. ours was. And creating lateral circulation has actually been a bit easier. But there's a bit of that element. And they're basically all officers. There's a sort of domestic feel about the whole building. You're absolutely right, Charles. So it's not, it's not as palatial as it looks on the outside. But of course, because we are both a university and a gallery, we wanted to make it as accessible as possible. I mean, it, in a sense, the motif of this of this project has been: if you if you care for art and you're also trying to work on art and think about the relevance of art to society, what you want to do is to make everything you do as open and as accessible as possible. And in a way, we're in a building which fights against that. It wasn't built to be open; it was built to be closed. Um, so if you go to the next slide, just sim, uh, sort of spatially speaking, this shows you the level of, well, let's call it level access with lifts and level floors that we had initially and the target we're heading towards. We haven't got the full, full way there, but we're trying to get to what was about 94% full absolute accessibility. And that's involved quite a lot of interventions. If I can go to the next slide. The, uh, and, and to create sort of circuits of, of communication around the building. The inner one, which you see there, is conceived as a public circuit. The outer one is much more for the academic organization um, than the, than the um, public themselves. But we, starting from where we enter the building, we have a challenge immediately. So next slide. Oh, something's got, can you, so can you move on one more slide and I'll come back to that. That's right. So even to get into the building up till now, there are 14 different changes of level until you get anywhere where you might have a lift. Steps, and these are all steps. And so that was, that's, that was a challenge. The, in terms of accessibility and visibility, there's another challenge, the next slide, is that the vestibule which provides our two entrances is dark. And unless you have something like this, which is a lot of publicity because we've got a special exhibition and you get cues with a flagging, something's going on. Most people walk straight past our entrance into the nice light courtyard with its fountains or its forest or whatever the events are. So we had a visibility problem as well. Um, ne now, can we, can you go back to the pre two slides previously, the one I missed and the one before? If you look at the, the inner circle of what we tend to call a donut because the vestibule punctures the building, one of the things, the, the lower part of that, that inner circle had, I think, four changes of level or five changes of level itself. And one of the major things we've done is push right through the vaults to create a whole new area, uh, which if you come forward again, you'll see. And that was the biggest engineering intrusion we had in the project because we actually had to take away the carriageway and lift it up, put in a false carriageway for all the big trucks coming in to service everything in Somerset House, jack, jack the whole building up there, 
and then build in this very beautiful, and this is not quite finished, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a photo from about a month ago, um, rather beautiful vaulted space, which is a completely new asset to the quarter, which links the two sides of the building, provides a route, we're going to have cafes and shops and activity there, I can have events there and so on, and really has created a sort of a lovely sense of a connectedness between the spaces. If you come forward again, I hope I've got in there next, come forward and again, no, come forward again, this might not have worked there. No, back, back one. We have now leveled off and now and laid granite sets rather than nasty tarmac and sloped very gently the whole carriageway and the, and the walkways on either side so that you can come into the building on level access on both sides. This was a sort of, it's beautifully discreet. Uh, we bumped into someone who's very familiar with the court hall the other day with, with Stephen Witherford, our wonderful architect, who I should have mentioned before, Witherford Watson Mann, whom Charles referenced about, um, abs um, not absolutely, um, I've lost it, the name of the- Astley Castle, oh, Astley, Astley. Sorry, uh, verbal confusion because of the inner history. Yeah. Yeah. And Stephen Witherford, the lead architect, stopped her and was talking to a person and said, so, so you know, do you like what we, you know, the changes? And they said, what changes? I don't see any changes. Now, I think that's actually an accolade to the architects. Um, People forget so quickly. I mean, we did disabled access at the portrait gallery and relayed the mosaic. And as long as it looks right, people don't, people forget that sort of thing. Absolutely. And, and anyway, so we now have a beautiful access to the building from street level. And then if you can now go to the next slide, which I hope is the, uh, this is the totally renovated um, entrance hall to, to what was the original Royal Academy entrance to, to, to the building, which is now our gallery entrance. Um, this is now totally restored. But one of the issues that we were concerned about was that it was, it was a horrible jumble before because it had a ticket desk, it had seating, it had, advertising it had god and knows what else in it and sort of destroyed the architecture and also the sense of space and the sense of entrance and in another sort of um brilliant um uh, concept which we did a good big intake of breath uh but sorry, sorry, um, Debbie, this is a photograph not a cgi this is a photograph this isn't yeah, the real that's it. as of as of points where where you might not be able to tell i'll tell you which is a cgi and which is which is that's a very recent photograph it was very, very, it was tidied up. It's not totally finished, but it's tidied up. We realized that we needed more space for visitor access and arrival. And we also had had a problem of getting uh, disability lifts up to the lift level, which is on that platform. So uh, next slide, please. We did something which the curators hated initially. We disappeared a gallery and made the gallery which was facing onto the street with darkened windows for medieval, a medieval treasury. We've made it into an entrance arrival hall. We've had to create, believe it or not, another cantilevered staircase because we were not allowed to take away the extremely dangerous small service staircase, which is the only way of getting to the lower ground floor and those vaults and the visitor facilities, the loos and so on. Um, I think the next slide might be a, an image of that. So, sorry, are you going to have pictures in that space? Or, or oh, is it just... No, it's, no, it's mainly... Get, well, they're, they're going to do some very, very big donor balls because it's cost a lot of money to, 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 to do this project and a lot of donors have supported. So some big donor balls. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, but it is flexible enough that we could do things in due course. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but it'll probably have a certain amount of... Uh, you know, it'll have all the visitor services and a place to gather. And we have created a platform lift for wheelchair access easily onto the platform from that space. But we have created a totally new cantilevered, or rather Stephen Witherford, Witherford Watson Man, have created a totally new cantilevered staircase um, in this building, so repeating the same theme. But let's, let's run on and, and show you what we've done with galleries. We moved the medieval treasury and we had to, so we've carved out space in what were stores, loos, and security on a mezzanine floor. That is a CGI. And if you give me the next slide, 
that is the actual space, of course, without anything in at the moment. So this is one floor up from the entrance? This is one floor up from the entrance. Okay. So we, we had previously created a drawings gallery as a sort of experiment, which is where we first worked with with Lid Watson Man. Yeah. And this flows through from that. So, uh, so, so can you, what else, what other galleries, because they've done opera houses, how much work have they done in museums and galleries before? That's a really good question. I'm not sure they have. Right. I think we have it. I think, I, think that, I think we are their first work in... So you were introduced to them through doing the drawings gallery, and then you presumably had a public competition. Well, we had a public competition with lots of the great and the good in the architectural world, um, you yeah. know, tendering and competing and shortlisting, and they won it against, against interesting but stiff competition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it was largely because of the, they, they understood they, they have a very strong sense of Masby Castle of, of the logic of historic buildings, but also the, the, the challenges of them. And they also are very good at understanding what our uh, what we were trying to achieve in the quarter, which was both opening up our doors, but also interconnecting these vertical buildings. And all their solutions and their thinking helped with that. They also have a very, as you also know, they have a very lovely sense of materials. And yeah, yeah, so it's maybe worth saying for the audience, this place they did um, north of Coventry, it's in the most tricky countryside, was a medieval castle which had been burnt out in the 1980s and then was acquired by the Landmark Trust, which normally does things in a very kind of historical way, but very imaginatively, about 15 years ago, they reconstructed it using Witherford Watson Man, who inserted a modern set of modern interiors. And exactly as Toby says, use, use very good materials and are sensitive to the historic character without being historical. And, and that kind of balance of, of respecting a historical building, but not trying to do it in a historical way is, I think, very good. No, that's absolutely right, Charles. And I think I probably, what I probably should have explained is that um, hitherto, we had the medieval treasury on the ground floor, and up till 2015, you would have to go up two floors to get to any galleries. So the, yeah, the, the medieval thing felt very separate. Yeah. As and, so, really and, separate. and so we were very keen to get this so-called mezzanine floor, which is now going to be called floor one, um, into the public domain. Uh, and, and that we have achieved, and we've actually created a, yeah, and, and so this is a, it's a lovely, suite of they're quite low ceiling guys because it's a mezzanine floor but but they i think they will have a lovely character um, and then we go on to what was the first gallery you would see in the court hold, which was the what we call the fine rooms they um of the of this this one which actually was um one of the royal academy fine rooms and looking at it now i mean we used to, you know, one way one goes in and one used to go in and one used to just sort of focus on the artworks. But actually, if you look at it, the thing that hits you in the eye is the rather garish pine floor with lots of its knots in it. The lighting, which is very patchy, the chandelier, which is sort of concealing, you know, blocking your view, the heavy chains of the hang and so on. And these galleries, there's six of these galleries, uh, we haven't, at one level, we haven't done anything radical, but we have changed everything. Uh, we have done everything we can to make the hang uh, more discreet, the art more visible. We've changed all the flooring. Uh, we have, we've actually changed around the, the order of the content as well. So, that, so we have much more of a historical sequence that's understandable and logical to an audience. Uh, and the feeling of these rooms in a funny way has suddenly become much greater. Now I'm going to show you that you notice all this, but if we can have the next slide, there's another strange phenomenon, which I, I, this picture really picks up. Every single door in this building opened inwards. It's exactly what you don't want in an art gallery. Um, and they had to be fixed. So they were both a hazard and, and an intrusion and somehow took away space. And one of the things, every single door was taken away. Uh, it were, it all, they all had to be treated for fire and all sorts of complex things. Um, 
They were brought back and fitted in such a way they will now fold back into the embrasures. Then they had to be taken off site again, and then they've been reworked with beautiful, you know, repainting because these are not mahogany doors. These are, um, I'm not sure what the timbers, but it's probably a form of deal, I'm not sure. But they have been, they're, of that period, they're made to look like mahogany. And they look beautiful now, but they will sit inside the embrasures. And that and has a huge additional sense of space in the gallery. It makes it, you know, thinking about modernism or feeling modern, it's a small touch, but it, it just adds to the sense of being able to breathe in these galleries. So um, moving on, I'll show you one of the now restored galleries, which has, of course, nothing in it at the moment. Uh, and I hope that you will have to struggle to see the lighting, um, the lighting rig, but it is there. But it's, 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 the aim is that the lighting, as were, well, disappears. That any. Sorry, who did you use as lighting consultant? Oh, God, this is, I'm going to be, um, some of the lighting was, was done. Oh, I, I'm going to. Okay, no, they, it would have been a subcontract. And as a subcontract, I'm about to say who we did ended up by not using, but I won't say that. But um, yeah, yes. used, <laughs> and, uh, and the floor, I mean, you were allowed the, to change the floor. Uh, the, the, the floor is all beautiful, and the next slide probably shows Dean Pet, it's all it's now all oak mm -hmm. and it's been beautifully laid. Uh, it's all, um, I think it's technically called European oak, but it's, it's English, in fact. Uh, and the, uh, as they did, at the, as, as you recall, uh, Charles, in Greenwich, uh, we have followed that 18th century system whereby the central planks are wider than the, than the than as they, and then they get narrow as they go towards the side of the room, um, which was a way a form of economy for using, using the tree more efficiently. So it's ecologically sound as well. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is actually the room which will show our 18th century British art, um, because we're moving on in time. And the next, the next, uh, that is a photograph. This one is now actually a CGI uh, showing uh, the way we'll be displayed with, with a large showcase in the middle, showing some of the court old silver and other, other three-dimensional works. So this is a CGI done by the people who are the designers, <laughs> there not, are not the yeah, our interior designers, yes. Um, and I'm going to do this one. Oh, this is helpful. <laughs> I, I, Sorry. I this It'll come before we finish our conversation. <laughs> shocking, shocking, shocking. Um, because I'm thinking too hard. I, I, I'm going to yeah. give them, I've got another name blocking it. Yeah. Um, but but, but the, the architects and designers work very well together. Um, and, yeah. and so, so, so that's, that's the first floor, a suite of six rooms, all of which just going to feel so much more beautiful and open. And, and, and we, we do tend to change the hand quite a lot. And that's, that's um, been much, much easier by the, all the vertical um, accessibility we now have. Moving on, we then come to the culmination of the visit, which is the top floor. And as you recall, the great room, the great room was as this, but we had divided it up in about 2000 into a lot of small low rooms and normally visitors wouldn't even look up to that to see the remnants of that as it were the great room up above them. Uh, they would tend to walk in and not, we did this photograph deliberately, walk in and see the works of art. But we have, what we have done on the top floor is, is, is the most dramatic thing in the whole um, scheme. So there's a plan coming up in the next slide where it would, may look very simple, but it, it wasn't. Um, Normally you'd come up the stairs and you'd walk through the ante room, which is a beautiful room in itself, but I haven't got a slide of it in this, in this suite. And then you'd come into the great room. Uh, in the, in the, about 1817, the room, you can see the room 10, the 20th century room, which had been a, a double story with a lot of little rooms, was turned into a single space. The anecdotal chat is that Turner, William Turner, had a lot to do with that. Um, we're actually trying to make sure we've got evidence of that, but it's, it's a good story. Up till now, on the other side, where we've got Mark Temporary Exhibition and the gallery space above that, that was still in a lot of little rooms. It was a met, had a mezzanine um, above it. 
it was curators rooms it was shop officers it, we had the conservation studio and historic england allowed us to strip that out to create these galleries which was very just so we restored the great room and they allowed us and we and we we were very very careful about a lot of the other historic spaces and they allowed us as it was a, as a very understanding trade-off to create new exhibition spaces out of the old space. Now I'll show you some slides of that in a minute. But in the meantime, if you just go to the next slide, uh, this is a CGI of, um, of the Great Room. The next slide gives you some sense of a bit of the works that we had to do to get there, but not, you know, actually it was a huge amount of work. Um, a lot of work had to be done with the floor. Um, the air handling system was very cleverly conce con uh, conceived and concealed so that we have a completely open space. It's hidden into embedded wall in the next room. And, um, and we found various discoveries, what are called discoveries, which mean technical problems with damp and this, that, and the other. Uh, but the next slide shows the great room. That's a photograph. Um, and uh, and this is what we will now be able to as well play with with our first hang and then with successive and um, varied hangs. And when we're going so to you have white walls, white walls. These are grey, actually. They're, 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 they've come up white, more than one. white, but not. They're actually, look much greyer than that in real life. Yeah. Right. Um, they're much, much. It's much quieter than that. That that's come up quite sharp. Um, the, the exhibition guys that we created really were, if you can go to the next slide, uh, with taking out, a, you can see the, 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 the lines of where there would have been floors. That was an unbelievably complex piece of engineering again, uh, at all sorts of levels, bringing in new steels, um, keeping the basic roof structure, the timber roof structure, bringing in concrete where we needed concrete. Uh, but what has resulted then, I think we may have a slide, yeah, is, is uh, that's a CGI, uh, but then if you move on one to the actual, uh, that is actually a photograph where they are deliberately in, the, the, the Witherford Watson Manor designed them so that they are modern in feel, but they're echoing the sort of sense of the, of the spaces that, um, uh, that Chambers would have created. No, no natural daylight, that's all artificial. There's a little bit of borrowed daylight on the north side in this gallery and on the on the east side in the adjacent part of the suite. So so like the 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 white window, sort of window halfway down, is that a window onto the outside world or is that just a bit of that's a glass door onto the landing of the other staircase which with by which people can exit and go okay. down the east their case to complete the circuit. But if um, the, the lighting on the, if you look at the left-hand side at the top, that is that is natural lighting. The false lighting on the right has been made to sort of mirror it as well as it can. But there is actual natural lighting coming in there. Uh, but it's very, it's, so it's very simple, very elegant and a lovely sense of space. And then finally, my final two slides are something we've done very differently. Uh, we, we made two further intrusions into what was part of the, let's call it the Institute part of the building, taking offices, spaces. One In one set, we've made what we call project space, which I haven't got a slide of. But in another, we, we have made a very domestic si style space uh, for our Bloomsbury collection. And we have gone very um, Charleston-esque with this. So a very different treatment indeed for a different part of the a different part of the building. This is also on the top floor. And so the visitor, the idea is the visitor will have a whole series of different sorts of experience as uh, as, as they, they go from up the building and through it and see the different collections and the different exhibitions and will see the understand the historic building but also get a sense of the historical in the modern. So that's the end of my, my slide. So um, happy to turn back to you, Charles. Uh, okay, so uh, I mean, I had put together also some images of the portrait gallery, which is uh, one of the projects which I did as a case study. But I, I actually think I'd sort of half anticipated that rather than going into a long monologue about the portrait gallery, 
at this juncture, because there are a lot of people listening, and because we're aiming to end at sort of 10 or 5 to 8, I think it would be good. I don't know, uh, uh, Claudia, are you, have you got questions? If there are no questions, I'm happy to talk about the portrait gallery. But I, I feel at this juncture, in a way, it would be good to invite both students and, mm. and other people who are sort of listening in if they have questions. Claudia. Yes, yeah, please, please um, feel, feel free to, to ask um, to the audience and, um, you know, to write your questions in the chat and the Q&A box if, if you'd like to. Um, yeah, no, I, I was, uh, I was, you know, it was so fascinating to see that um, kind of taking us through the journey of, 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 of the courthold and its transformation and, you know, just to see that the, the attention to materials, you know, in, 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 such, in such great detail. Um, and really revealing the beauty of the building. Um, but um, yeah, and I look forward to rediscovering it, particularly the, the Bloomsbury section, you know, and the, and the kind of different ways in which you're displaying those, those works. But, um, but yeah, I was, I was wondering about, you know, if there were particular models of museum or gallery transformation that you've looked to whilst, you know, because obviously you've done these consultations and you're working with brilliant architects, but, you know, just because the Cordell is, has, is that particular example of combining a university, so you've, you know, you've got to serve the students, but you're also, as you say, looking outwards, you're, you're wanting to open up and welcome in the public in a new way. So I wondered where, whether there were particular examples. Yeah, yeah there absolutely were. I mean, and, and perhaps I, you know, the one thing I missed out was, was, was sort of relevant to that, or one of the things I missed out. We, no, we, did, we, we did a lot of visiting of, of university museums and galleries, and I think the, probably the two that, uh, from the point of view of the, inter, the interaction between the, sort of the public and the spaces which the university dimension of the Courtauld could, could most use uh, was the, uh, the visits to Yale and to Harvard, both of which have in recent years um, uh, done major re you know, renovations, refurbishments, expansions of their activity and thought very hard about uh, creating spaces where students, faculty and curators can interact. Um, they, they had more space than us and probably a lot more, well I know, a lot more money than us, uh, but what, one of the um, the little suite that we've created, which is on the on the first or well, the present first floor, the new second floor, uh, is creating a, a small um, gallery, which uh, which actually is made out of another office, and what was a very rather grand loo, but a loo positioned in what was an old staircase, uh, and then a third office adjacent to that into a little suite where. We will be doing exhibitions which students can be involved in, the faculty can be involved in, uh, and can use any material. We, we've got a lot of collections in addition to our so-called art collection. We've got amazing photographs, for example. We want to do exhibitions where conservation can explain the work being done with its, um, you know, in, in, in progress on projects, for example. Uh, We've, we do a lot of work with, with outreach to schools and communities and, and we've also got a learning, we actually have added, we've also got a new learning centre embedded in this project too, uh, where there will be some display facility as well. So actually in that, that case, all the walls have been magnetised so that we can use the walls for anything. Mm. Um, but, but so there are these ancillary spaces where we want to be able to do other quite sort of um, inventive, probably not very high cost, uh, but 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 things where we can they can be quite quick turnover and quite easy and students also of course have have been already regularly involved in the exhibitions in the the, paper, the works on paper gallery yeah. and will continue which has a program of several exhibitions a year and we also have an MA curating um, uh, program and the students are likely to be using the exhibition suite for as they have done in the a version of in the past for their annual um, physical exhibition. The last two years they've had to do online exhibitions, of course, but um, that's- so, so Debbie, we're getting some questions in the q and A's. Sure. What, what's the overall increase in Gary space? Not gigantic, no, presumably. Not huge at all, no, yeah. because, because, because we, we, are, we, we are constrained on in our footprint. Um, so I, we you, have- You did have space opposite on the other side of the entrance sort of, uh, Whatever you call it. 
uh, we uh, no no. Uh, I mean, the North Block itself is it was was used for our conservation department, which has also been renovated, uh, yeah. the gallery, and of course art history. And we have at times we've now we're now working from Vernon Square in the North. So it's actually quite a small amount of additional actual square footage, but there is some. Um, uh, which is a trade-off against, you know, the curator's offices are now going to be somewhere else, and that's become gallery. The vaults were non-space and have become space. Curators, I know, and I'm one too, curators being curators, we don't just work on foot space, we work on wall space. And so, actually, we've taken away some walls, so we've actually probably got net the same amount of wall space. Um, so it's not it's not a major and that's not that wasn't really the the aim of the project to massively increase what we've tried to do is to make sure that we can use every inch of space that we have as flexibly and as well as we possibly can and to make sure that the operations of the institution are smooth so we have we've created storage in the basements which has lift access which we didn't have before we will other than perhaps our very, very biggest items and heaviest, we will no longer have to carry objects up the stairs. I mean, it's been as basic as that. So, um, so there are a lot of, of benefits for the way we'll be operating. Uh, okay, so there are a couple of uh, somewhat esoteric questions that um, you may, may, may or may not be able to answer. And, well, actually, I ought to know, where was the RA school's life from in Somerset House as an RA? alumni, I was told it was first built for Somerset House. The, the life room was that one where you put the staircase in, wasn't it? Uh, no. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, it was. It was. It was yeah. one where we put the staircase in. And then, I mean, and that then, drawing of yes. them working in the life room. That's right. It's in that one. It's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. It's that and, one. and then the second question, is it possible to see the tomb of Verazio Gentileschi, father of Artemisia, in the crypt below the courtyard? Oh, yes, I know, you can, you can. it's nothing to do with you. It's a rather well, an amazing well, space. It's nothing to do with, with, with me. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, you, have to, you have to apply, as it were, to Somerset House. They do, they do periodically, you know, have open, open days when you can go through the, there's the road almost across the, underneath the courtyard. So watch out for those, um, those open days. Uh, yeah. You know, historical open days yeah absolutely or even the art fairs uh, i mean i've only seen it by accidentally wandering in from, yes sometimes the the art fairs yeah. actually utilize that and then it gets opened yes exactly yeah, yeah. so next question is uh, what's the estimated date for the reopening um november um, um I, we can't say anything more than that but it will be in november and, and do you have a, uh, this is my question, do you have an indication of the overall project cost or are you going to say how much it costs? It's, uh, I, I would, it's been over 50 million. Um, yeah. it's, and, and we're, you know, there, there's some things moving around in it in terms of various bits of tax and so on and what we do and don't have to pay. So I can't actually give you an exact figure. It's, yeah. been, it's, 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 it's been very substantial, but of course that cost also involves moving a whole university, I mean, albeit a small one, uh, taking leases on other spaces. Uh, you know, there's lots of ancillary costs. We had to move the whole collection out to storage. Um, you know, so there's the construction cost. There's the, we, we did, as Charles will be very familiar with this, um, we, we've done a very big activity plan because, you know, as part of our uh, work with the National Lottery Heritage Fund, with touring all over the country, with volunteer projects. Uh, so there are lots and lots of sort of elements of the cost that go into you that. You toured the collection, you showed the collection at the Louis Vuitton space in Paris. Yeah, that but was very interesting. It was great fun, yes. It was a very good catalogue. And then did you tour it in Japan? We did, and that was, of course, that was interesting because we got to Japan, we did the first venue in Tokyo, and then we moved it to, let me get which one, which order it was in, uh, Nagoya, and it got, we had a short period of time open in Nagoya and then it was closed down with COVID. Okay. We then took the risk of moving it to the third venue in Kobe and it never opened. Right. And at that point it wasn't possible to bring half couriers. So we, we championed a virtual couriering. So our Japanese, Japanese couriers brought it back, packed, took down, packed, 
and brought it back to Heathrow and turned around and went back to Japan. Yeah. Uh, and we've been lecturing on virtual couriering ever since. <laughs> and it, you didn't send it to Canberra? No, no, we didn't. No. Oh, I know, it's the National Gallery. I no, mean, it, it, in my time at the National Gallery, it was slightly taboo to send things such distances. So. Oh, yeah, no, it wasn't, no, no, it wasn't that. No, I, I think you, and I was wondering whether you were thinking about when the, the, the collection was toured, was toured to Australia in the 90s. Right. Uh, the previous refurbishment for short uh, closure. And, uh, yeah, so dear. I'm just going to ask, what, what exhibitions do you plan for, for opening? Well, hopefully opening in, in November. Is there a... Uh, yes, yes. You the, feel? The, 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 the first, the, 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 the primary exhibition that we're opening with um, and, and wait for press releases next week for subsequent exhibitions, because we're going to release that next week. Um, uh, We've had a wonderful new acquisition or set of acquisitions, um, a collection of, of uh, 20th century drawings by some of the great, the great 20th century sort of masters, uh, mm -hmm. which has come to us as a, as a request. Um, and uh, the Carshan collection. And it's got um, you know, big names of, it's got as early as Cezanne, but you've got people like Twombly and Oh, you know, just name, almost name your name of, of sort of big, particularly American, but not solely American, um, uh, great, great um, artists of the of the second half of the 20th century. And that will be the opening one. And uh, we will be revealing our subsequent program next week. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. So it will really enhance the, the works on paper collection. Uh, very much so, yes. And then we're also showing us, uh, so we've got an amazing, uh, of our amazing photographic collections, we're showing works from a collection, uh, the, the work of, uh, of a photographer called Anthony Kirsting, which came to us as a bequest also in the- Oh, he was an architectural, A.F. Kirsting. Absolutely, yeah. he did, he traveled all over the world. Um, he did a lot of country life, but he did, and there, there are some amazing photographs of the Middle East, of course, including uh, buildings in parts of say Kurdistan, which have been destroyed that subsequently, and of the peoples who suffered hugely in the warfare in, in that area. So we're starting with that. Mm. Yeah, so that's going to be quite wonderful. Wonderful program. Yeah. And, 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 then, and then I think the British uh, works on paper in the, in the in drawings gallery as well. So, so any final questions? Okay. Uh, any questions from the students? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I will end by saying it, I mean, you, you said, which is true to an extent, my book is about mainly new museums of mainly modern art yes. and not so much of historical institutions. But I did include like the Christchurch Picture Gallery, which is, you know, not modern art, but an Oxbridge College trying to tussle with the issue of how to display its own historical collection and I include it the Louvre in terms of how it tried to reinvent itself in the 1980s and I included the Portugal which was trying to have a contemporary element but was also how you display historical paintings um, so that from my perspective what you're doing at the court held is highly relevant. The, the, the aspect of it which I think is particularly interesting for me is the extent to which the speed up of change and the ambition of the change so that you know it was what 1990 that you moved in and it was all redone then and yeah. was pretty controversial yeah. and then it was fairly quickly redone by John Maddox uh, yeah. with whom we both worked from the V&A in the late 90s, yeah. and now completely reinvented. One of the things I found with my book is that, in, in a good way, but in a problematic way in some ways, everybody now is interested in what's going to happen in the future. Oh. So it seems to me <laughs> we should end by... I mean, this could be one of the last of the big radical lottery funded transformations. Although having said that, the Portugal will open in two years time. 
having completely redone everything from top to bottom. And the VA is doing the VA East, which opens, I think, in 2024. And the National Gallery, interestingly, has announced as its, so to speak, contribution to COVID, redoing the Sainsbury Wing. Yeah. So that my view was when I wrote my conclusion that there would be a period of pretty severe retrenchment because it was obvious that. Um, you know, there wouldn't be the money in the way there has been over the last 20 years helped by the lottery fund. But maybe, maybe because people have got so used to these reinventions, there will continue to be a big drive towards reinvention. I mean, I think there's a really interesting, really interesting question because certainly the National Portrait Gallery and ourselves, we, we, we got the last big grants. We loved that they, they actually cut because their income was reduced. So it's a fascinating question. Um, about what will happen in the future. I mean, the, clearly buildings need refreshment regardless. I mean, I think that that need will remain. And because they need refreshment, because they sort of wear out or they, they simply aren't working for even what of them can modern and then contemporary purposes, things have to be done. But I think that, I think we are at a point of change regard, despite that. One of the things, what we've tried to do with this project is to deal with the building in such a way that it can be used for any sort of collection. I mean, that, that you know, that it, that, and we've tried to get maximum flexibility. We may not use all that flexibility initially, but the aim is that it's got at least 30 to 50 years where without too much reinvention, it, the content absolutely can be can be can be changed in the way you deal with it fundamental to that because that's what hadn't perhaps been done before i mean the the ME, the, the the mechanical and engineering hinterland of this project has been brilliant i mean it's it's actually it's just beautiful i mean uh, some of our presentations just have to show copper pipes i mean but they man i mean that's one of the challenges of managing in an old building trying to get the services so that they're logical and they work within the framework of a structure. And I think we've achieved that in a way that absolutely wasn't achieved in the 1980s. So that means that the, 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 the aim is that the building will have a, a much greater duration, as it were, albeit we anticipate, of course, it'll have some change of use in some way, a uh, change of way that you look at things. So we've tried to do that, but I think I agree with you generally. I think we're at a turning point, regardless. Okay, Debbie. So the last last thing in the Q and A box is thank you very much <laughs> in capital letters. So, <laughs> before I hand back to Claudia, thank you very much indeed. I found it really interesting to hear about what you've been doing, and I look forward to seeing it in November. Oh, uh, yeah, if not before. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so Let much me. for the opportunity and to Claudia too. Yes, let, let me um, emphasize that and that, that thanks. And um, thank you so much, both of you, for, for joining us this evening. It's been really fascinating to get this insight into the very depths and heart of the building. And I'm sure we all look forward to visiting the Courtauld in, in November and particularly discovering the, the, new, the new collection of 20th century uh, drawings and works on paper. That'll be very exciting for the Royal Drawing School in particular. You'll be very, very welcome, and, let's, and, uh, um, and we'll find ways of, of, of formally inviting the Royal Drawing School students, particularly for uh, in, in some particular way. Yeah, thank you. Much appreciated. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.